Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here and tuning in. We continue to pivot to the recovery phase of our response. As you know, on Monday I was in Hardwick with Secretary Pete, assessing damage and meeting with Vermonters who have been facing significant losses. Yesterday I was in southern Vermont in Weston and Ludlow doing the very same thing. And it's clear we still have a lot of work ahead of us. They've done a tremendous amount in the last few days, but there's a lot of work ahead of us. The Vermonters continue to inspire me with their resilience and can-do attitude. There are many resources available to Vermonters as we recover. We have a comprehensive list all in one place, and that's at vermont.gov slash flood, vermont.gov slash vermont. Here today with us, uh, we have a federal coordinating officer, Will Roy from FEMA, and he'll be talking about the work FEMA is doing and the financial help available for communities and individuals. But I think it's important uh, to be clear and level set expectations. These FEMA funds are not for businesses. And I know many businesses are impacted. I've seen it for myself in downtown Barrie, Ludlow, Montpelier, and many, many other communities throughout the state. Now, there are Small Business Administration loans available to help, and we'll talk more about that in the coming days, or you can go to accd.vermont.gov slash flood. We also know uh, more help will be needed, and uh, we have a very creative team looking for ways to bridge this gap as we speak. And we'll also need help from Congress uh, to make sure Vermont businesses can survive, and we're working with our congressional delegation on that as well. But there are a couple things we can do right now. So I'm directing the tax commissioner to extend the due date for filing and payment of sales tax, rooms and meals, and Vermont payroll withholding tax to November 15th for those impacted by flooding. And on Friday, we'll be announcing more actions to help. Today, we'll also have an update from Commissioner Haas from the Department of Mental Health to go over tools available to people who are, understandably, going through a lot right now and need some support. I want you to know it's okay to reach out for help. And Commissioner Haas will explain just how to do that. On another note, my team is working to break down silos between agencies and departments, as well as nonprofits and private entities to ensure we're coordinating and doing as much as we can to help people through this. And that wor work won't stop once these events begin getting less attention. Again, it's a long, long road ahead. And this will be difficult, but we're in it with Vermonters until the very end. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Morrison for a situational update. Thank you. Good morning. I will provide some updates on rescue and emergency operations as well as guidance on debris removal and volunteering. Happily, no rescues were made last night. <clears throat> we have begun demobilizing out-of-state teams who came to assist. And here is a summary of rescue-related operations to date. 211 people were rescued from homes, vehicles, trees, the top of a car carrier, a floating hot tub wedged on a tree, and a floating dumpster. These rescues were conducted by boats or by rescuers walking through deep water. An additional, an additional 127 evacuations were conducted in the first two days of the flooding and 18 animals were transported or rescued from homes and vehicles. Our swift water and urban search and rescue assets will remain staged throughout the state to respond to any future emergencies. We still have just the one death related to this event. I want to remind everyone that many injuries and deaths related to a disaster happen after the acute emergency and during the cleanup and recovery phase. Please exercise caution as you go about cleaning up and drying out our residential and business buildings. Household debris has nails, sharp edges, and other hazards. 
Please remember that our waterways have significant debris in them and unusually strong currents. It is not business as usual yet for recreation on or around our rivers, streams, and lakes. In addition to our swift water and urban search and rescue teams, the state's Division of Fire Safety and our hazardous materials teams have been extremely busy. In just the past week, our HAZMAT teams have completed 75 responses, which represents 50% of our annual call volume. Fire safety has had rapid assessment teams in the field, which consist of an electrical, plumbing, and building inspector together, primarily focused on imminent life safety hazards to prevent accidental electrocutions, explosions, and to identify structural integrity issues. Many structures were evacuated with the power still on. Our teams have found water halfway up to electrical panels, submerged electrical meters, and more. These inspections provide critical safety warnings to residents and cleanup crews. So far this week, we have completed more than 750 of these rapid inspections. The Division of Fire Safety has provided numerous informational resources and guidance on safety related to this disaster. We have also modified our database to accept no fee permits. Previously, you had to enter a monetary amount for work notices. This change has allowed work notices for emergency repairs to be entered into our database with no fee. We anticipate that there will be a high degree of need for all of our emergency response teams for the near future. And we, we remind you that if your home was flooded, please have a qualified electrician inspect your system before you turn the power back on or begin to use electricity. We've been fortunate to have national support from companies like Amazon, who sent truckloads of dehumidifiers and fans to Vermont. Within hours of arrival, these items were distributed by the National Guard to the 30 hardest hit towns in Vermont. I know that there have been more acts of corporate generosity, but they've only allotted me so much time today. I've been inspired by many stories from the field of neighbor helping neighbor, people helping people and municipalities helping one another. For instance, St. Albans sent dehumidifiers to Waterbury, while Burlington and South Burlington sent public works vehicles and staff to hard hit towns. These are just a few examples of the generous spirit of Vermont taking place all over the state. Right now, we need an all hands on deck to help every home and business and farm impacted by the flooding to get clean and dry. Clean and dry is the rallying cry of the day. Get the wet carpet, sheetrock and such out to the curb or within 10 feet of the public right of way, sort it into the relevant piles for pickup. And I have a visual that I have left for the media that is a good description of how to sort the piles of debris. Let's make a push to get this done before the end of the weekend. We are working hard to connect volunteers and volunteer organizations to residents who need assistance at their homes. Community volunteers should continue to register with www.vermont.gov forward slash volunteer so the team at Serve Vermont can match you with missions in communities all around the state. Once registered, you may receive notice of volunteer missions in your area and you can respond with your availability for that particular mission. This helps coordinate assets. Please be patient. Connecting volunteers to missions can take some time as communities begin the recovery process. This effort is not intended to replace grassroots local volunteer efforts. We continue to encourage Vermonters to join local efforts as they arise. It is often most effective to volunteer with local organizations that you are already affiliated with. Anything you can do to help us get clean and dry will be very helpful. There are many voluntary organizations both within Vermont and those that operate nationally that are now active in our communities. We are asking these organizations, not individuals, please do not self-deploy. <clears throat> the state is recommending the use of crisiscleanup.org for organizations to manage your missions. We have a team taking information from 211 damage reports and contacting individuals who have reported damage to inquire about what assistance they may need. 
The results of those calls will be entered into crisiscleanup.org. <clears throat> we encourage all volunteer organizations operating in Vermont to adopt cleanup missions via crisis cleanup to ensure the best coordination of resources. Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, also known as VODA, is also coordinating activities statewide. We encourage municipalities, again, not individuals who should use 211, to sign up for crisiscleanup.org access. There you can see details about damaged structures, who has asked for help, and which volunteer organizations are active in your area. The system will provide details about which missions have already been adopted by one of these organizations and which remain in need. Municipalities may also choose to use this app to match municipally based volunteers to requests for assistance that remain open in the system. All of this information about volunteer coordination and debris management is available at vermont.gov forward slash flood. And with that, I will turn it over to FCO Roy. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Uh, good morning. Uh, federal Coordinating Officer William Roy. Um, I'm not only your, your Federal Coordinating Officer, I'm also a fellow resident of Vermont, so sort of blessed to be here with my fellow Vermonters. Um, before I begin some, some prepared remarks from uh, FEMA, uh, I would just like to uh, uh, talk about uh, two days ago when the Secretary of Transportation came up and the Governor uh, took him through northern part of Vermont to show him the, the destruction. As we went from town to town, the governor talked about each location uh, from personal knowledge. Uh, not only the devastation that we're seeing from the storm, but also the impact over years of, of loss of, of uh, opportunities for, for revenues and businesses. Uh, so it was clear to see the governor's focus was on the long view. Not only do we need to recover from the current uh, a problem from the, from the uh, storms, you know, the culverts, the bridges, the, the roads, uh, the baseball fields, uh, the rail trail. But we also uh, need to focus on the long-term recovery, and that's one of the th things FEMA is focusing on as well with the state. So we're here for the long haul. Uh, we, uh, uh, each day, uh, we have a, a, a up brief uh, to the uh, Governor on, on actions and activities, and so I'll use this morning's brief to the Governor, if I could, to just sure. to talk about the things we are doing with the state. And, and I will tell you that we're so drawn to the state that when his uh, Emergency Operations uh, Center manager briefs him, the slides he's briefing are, are all of the work that FEMA is doing. I mean, we are truly nested with each other on the operations. Uh, so uh, uh, as of this morning, uh, there are 331 personnel from Vermont, uh, in Vermont from FEMA. Uh, as of uh, last evening, there are 1,980 homes that have been visited by uh, our disaster survivor assistants. Those are the people that go and knock on doors to ask people what help they need and help them to sign up for FEMA assistance. And they've also visited 144 businesses because members from the Small Business Administration join our folks as they do their walkabouts to offer assistance. Uh, we're also supporting three multi-agency uh, resource centers that the state has set up. And I've been doing this for a while, and I've never seen a state lean so far forward and set up centers like this. Uh, and so we're supporting ones that uh, are in, in, in a number of the communities. And we're also standing up mobile registration intake centers uh, in uh, Waterbury, uh, Woodsboro, Ludlow, and Springfield, uh, where people can go to sign up uh, for their assistance. Uh, as far as individual uh, registration for assistance, um, and to put this in context, uh, context uh, for Irene, there were about 4,000 people who signed up for assistance. Uh, as of uh, last night, there were 1,644 people already signed up for assistance. Um, 96 of them were from undeclared counties, uh, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Um, the nice thing is, for those from undeclared counties, should they be declared, the process continues automatically. They don't have to do a thing. Uh, as of last night, we approved over $700,000 for support for uh, individuals and households for the average of about $6,100 uh, uh, per person. Uh, 
the, the way this process starts, if you've, if you're at the individual level, if you have damage to your home, uh, you, you, you call FEMA, you, you uh, uh, go online to sign up for assistance, and the first thing that starts is we have a housing inspection. Um, and so there have been 991 requests for housing inspection, and as of last evening, we already inspected 177 homes. Uh, today uh, and, and yesterday, and we'll continue on, we're actually out in the field looking for public assistance assessments. Uh, so those roads, those bridges, those culverts that, that were damaged, we're assessing those and working with uh, all the townships uh, on, on the process to assess the overall damages uh, to get them declared for that type of assistance. Um, and then uh, I also know, obviously, of great interest, we had six declared counties. Um, there are a number of other counties that we're working with the state uh, to request additional individual assistance. Um, and so uh, I think we are in a good place uh, with, with Vermont. It is leaning forward like no other state I've walked, uh, worked in. Uh, and so a couple other uh, quick notes. Um, uh, I think it was announced already that the president's approved 100% funding for emergency protective measures uh, for a 30-day period. Um, and uh, there are, un unfortunate nature of this business, there are people who will take advantage of it, uh, so we have to keep our eye out for scams. So we've put out information already. Uh, if somebody comes to your door, they will have FEMA identification. If they do not, um, don't trust them. Um, and so uh, as, of, uh, as of right now, working with the Small Business Administration, they have also opened up two business uh, resource centers, uh, one here in Berlin, one in Berlin, and then one in Ludlow. Um, and so we are here uh, for the recovery, the short-term recovery, to get you know, people back on their feet. And we're here for the long haul, hopefully, sir, to help with that rail trail that will bring in uh, economic uh, support to the north. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll be so followed by Commissioner Hawes. Thank you. Um, Emily Hawes, Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. I know many of us are facing challenges left in the wake of the historic flooding that swept through our beautiful state. Our homes, roadways, and businesses, both large and small, have sustained damages that will uh, leave a lasting mark on our communities. Moreover, there are invisible damages. The toll this has taken on our neighbors, whose lives have been upended, on our brave emergency and essential workers, and on volunteers dedicating their time to piecing our communities back together. As we come together to rebuild what was damaged and lost, I want to emphasize the importance of prioritizing the well-being of our communities. This means addressing the crucial impact of natural disasters on our mental health. It is not just visible destruction that leaves a lasting impact. Its effect on our hearts and minds can linger long after rebuilding has started. <clears throat> First and foremost, let's make a conscious effort to seek updates and information from credible resources. It is important that we stay in the know but limit our exposure to media that is distressing and that can impact our emotional well-being. Instead, let's focus on consuming information from experts who can guide us reliably through these challenging times. Caring for our well-being also includes being attentive to our physical and emotional needs. I encourage you to try to maintain a routine that brings you stability amongst the chaos. Remember to prioritize self-care by resting, moving, and fueling your body with food and water. Take time for calming practices like deep breathing, meditation, and creativity. And weave these practices into your day to day throughout all stages of your disaster response effort, not just during the onset of the crisis. If you are providing direct services and support to flood relief, remember that resting is not a selfish act. Taking breaks help us bring our best selves to the table 
so we can make a meaningful impact. Lean on your teammates for support and develop a buddy system in order to monitor one another's stress, workload, and safety. Keep in mind that communication is key when it comes to well-being well -being and building a resilient community. Reach out to your trusted loved ones and friends. Share your feelings and emotional challenges. And oftentimes the greatest support we can find is in one another. Involve those close to you in preparations or planning after the initial conversation. Remember that seeking help is an act of self-care and strength. If you or someone you know is grappling with intense feelings that seem to linger, consider reaching out to a mental health resource. You can call or text 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, or compassionate crisis care professionals are available to offer support and resources for yourself or a loved one 24 seven. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to meet with our local 988 staff. They are fully prepared and ready to answer your calls. Additionally, the SAMHSA Disaster Distressed Helpline is there for you 24 seven, ready to provide support via text or email. The Department of Mental Health has also compiled a webpage of resources for folks directly and indirectly impacted by flooding. You can view these resources at mentalhealth.vermont.gov flood. We don't have to face obstacles alone and the assistance of professionals adds more tools to our wellness toolbox. By embracing these practices and resources, we create an environment that thrives on compassion, mutual support, and understanding. The resilience of our community starts with our commitment to taking care of ourselves and our neighbors. We are in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, before I open up to questions, I just wanted to comment as well. Uh, Will Roy uh, was very helpful to us during the pandemic with, in his role at FEMA. Um, but he also uh, was uh, retired as a Brigadier General uh, and um, served our country in Afghanistan, was deployed there uh, to probably many other places as well. So uh, true public servant. I'll open up to questions. Governor, that uh, 1980, I believe, for homes and 144 businesses, that those numbers that were mentioned, is that the totality of the damage, or are there still homes and businesses we haven't visited? Yeah, I, I, I believe that's just a raw number at this point and, and a dynamic number that is being added to. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe we've, we've gone and we know the extent of all the damages. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was in... Ludlow yesterday, uh, they have a, their municipal sewer treatment plant uh, is down, uh, but they also uh, identified a, a crushed pipe under the Black River, um, the main pipe going into the sewer treatment plant that is not going to be a quick or easy fix. So those types of things we're finding every day, as well as slides and so forth that are still um, we're vulnerable to uh, because of the saturated soils and uh, some of those uh, could could come down even in, over the next month or so. So again, we don't know the, the, the total impact, uh, but we're getting closer. What's your biggest concern right now as we are, what, eight or nine days from the event? Um, multiple. Uh, you know, I... I'm still concerned about the weather. Um, it seems as though every time we catch a break and we get a, a day or two of sunshine and drying out, it's followed by another rain event. Uh, we, we didn't have uh, the rain in some places, um, certainly not in this area uh, that, uh, that we expected, but uh, we had almost two inches uh, down in the, the uh, south uh, eastern part of the state last night and in some places and they've been hit the hardest and and we don't see that as much here in this area but um, but certainly uh, those types of events the flash flooding with the saturated soils that we have uh, just add to 
uh, both the day-to-day -day challenges but the overall recovery. So again, once we can get through and uh, make sure that uh, we're on the road to recovery and dry out some, and, and um, then we can we can look forward. But uh, but again, we have to do both at the same time. As you know, if you go to Montpelier or Barry, any one of these impacted communities, there's just a a flood of contractors that have come in from out of the state. What is the state doing to organize and to take stock of some of those contractors and to vet them, to make sure that they are uh, legitimate and that they're here to, to help? Yeah, um, I don't know if you can speak to that. I can't speak to that. <laughs> Not off the top of my head, I can't. You know, we, um, some of those contractors obviously uh, aren't ones that we coordinated. They were coordinated between uh, a business uh, and that, uh, that contractor uh, individually or the municipality and, uh, and that contractor. Um, we would offer that if you haven't fully vetted, um, make sure that you go and uh, go to the, um, the Attorney General's website and I believe that she uh, has provided information uh, for vetting there and if you have any questions at all give us a call or give the Attorney General a call so we make sure uh, that uh, you don't get yourself into to peril. You mentioned right at the beginning of the press conference that FEMA is here to help with individuals in their homes and also for public infrastructure but the situation is different from businesses. Uh, you know, I've heard from a number of businesses in downtown Montpelier who are saying you know, their lifeline is basically a small business administration loan at 4% and in 20 years, you're a former business owner. Uh, that, that, that's a tough factor in their decision whether or not to reopen or not. Yeah, this is, uh, this is something I've heard uh, throughout the state and in some of my visits with uh, the community members. Uh, for instance, when we were on our tour on Monday, we were in Hardwick, and uh, the motel there that was in the river, literally in the river. And the owners uh, were there. Um, that uh, I've seen, they've had um, some, some uh, change in ownership of that uh, facility for decades. Um, but these folks that came in, uh, they were retiring, uh, bought that business. He was a in the, he was a building contractor. Fixed it up himself. They lived there, and uh, they turned the place around and made it uh, into something that was uh, very special and uh, very essential in some respects to the vitality, the economic vitality of the community. So uh, at this point in time, I mean, we were talking to him and um, and her about this that. Um, you know, they're in their 70s now. And do they want to take out another loan uh, to, to put into this uh, particular piece of property, this, this venture, um, and have to rebuild and pay that over a long period of time? So these are tough, tough decisions to make. I'm hopeful. Um, again, we're trying to get creative to try to provide uh, bridge funding uh, for some of these businesses. Um, but um, but we're going to need some help from Congress uh, in this regard or the president. Um, this is nothing that we can do on our own. So uh, the congressional delegation is, is going to do all they can uh, to provide for relief. But um, but I just want to just want to level set this so that uh, the expectations aren't too high, and um, we'll do all we can. But um, but we don't have the resources to make them whole. Do you see any role for the Vermont legislature to help provide funding for some of these businesses? Well, again, uh, we'll, we need to get through this period of time, um, the response, uh, then in the recovery, and we're working on issues uh, right now and, and, and maybe some relief uh, that we can provide. But uh, obviously, uh, this is a, a long, uh, drawn-out affair in terms of recovery, so yes. The uh, simple answer is uh, some of the ideas uh, uh, that we've had over the past in terms of helping uh, businesses in the state uh, for uh, economic recovery uh, are going to be ongoing and we're going to be asking for more assistance to help businesses in Vermont because that's the lifeblood uh, of, uh, of our state, right? We need uh, the resource, we need the tax revenue 
in order to survive. So if we don't have the economy rolling and we don't have businesses to do that, um, we're, we're going to be impacted. So it's in our best interest uh, to help businesses recover from this. Any sense of how many acres of farmland have been impacted uh, during the storm? And also maybe just a sense of how many roads currently, I don't know if you need the full list, but maybe just how many roads are, are currently impacted as well? I can, uh, I, I don't know if uh, Secretary Tebbets is on, but he might be able to answer that question if he is on. He is not on. We can follow up. Okay, and yeah, I'm sure he has those details. Do you have any information you might be able to come up and provide? Thank you, Governor. Currently today we have 12 state roads that remain closed, 12 state roads that are partially open, which means they would be one lane. Three state roads reopened last night and since the beginning of the storm, we've reopened 103 state roads, which is 232 miles. I'll just add that today we're working with 56 contractors on AOT projects around the state of Vermont. We currently also have five state bridges which are closed, one completely missing and then a degree of damage to the other four. We have conducted 311 inspections on bridges, both state and local, across Vermont, having done 43 just yesterday. And lastly, 64 mile of rail remains closed, primarily the Green Mount Railroad between Rutland and Bellis Falls. Thank you. I think there was a question about acreage. Yes, it's total acreage of yeah. farm. So um, as of Friday, so USDA Farm Service Agency is, um, is the reporting agency. So they're collecting data from farmers that are reporting in. As of Friday, uh, and we're, what are we today? Is this Wednesday? Uh, 7,000 acres had been reported, but that's as of Friday. I'm sure there's much more now and uh, dozens of farmers. Um, the damage is um, corn still under underwater. Do not know if it's going to come back or not. And we're talking about debris today. The debris is enormous on many of these um, many of these farms, so that's got to be taken care of with silt, you know, all the debris that came down the rivers. So that's where we're at right now. Still, farmers really need to report their damages to the FSA so we can get more data so we can get it to Washington. So also, also I, just, I just want to follow up on that also, Calvin. Um, I know we reported on the, the state infrastructure and state highways and so forth, but um, for instance, I was in Weston yesterday uh, with the road commissioner and uh, the entire select board of three, I believe, and we went up uh, one of, just one of the roads impacted probably a mile long in complete devastation, like the, the road is missing. Um, so I would venture to say there, there are hundreds of miles of, uh, of town and municipal roads uh, that have been impacted and uh, and impacted a great deal. So this is going to be a, a long recovery for them. Uh, and you know some of the challenges we faced before this event are with us today. And we talk about workforce. And uh, so when you think about all the contractors and all the projects that we uh, we were going to have to accomplish this summer, um, now this is you know, this is times three or times four, and we simply don't have the workforce to, to, to do it all in one season. So we're going to have to prioritize. He just started. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So we're talking about farms, roads, looking at everything from a broad perspective. I know it's still somewhat early on, but is there any type of ballpark number on just the total financial impacts and costs that the storm has had, or do you think we'll be able to get to maybe some type of number eventually? Yeah, again, I wouldn't venture a guess on that unless someone else wants to. <laughs> you no, know, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. Um, it's a lot of money. That's all I know. We'll go to uh, Peter, Vermont Digger. <clears throat> um, 
Is there a sense, uh, an estimate for how many people are still currently displaced? We have um, we have the numbers from um, some of the Red Cross sites. I don't know if we anyone here has them. Sir. Yeah. 62 is this morning. Maybe uh, yes, I could ask FEMA to report on that. Uh, I think there are five Red yes, Cross sir. sites. I think we're at four right now. They're uh, Barry, Rutland, Johnson, uh, and Ludlow. Total of 62. A number of them, though, were pre storm uh, residents of the shelters as well. So not a large number of people. But just because the shelters don't have a large number of people, um, you know, I was talking to the governor, governor uh, before this press conference. You know, in the Christmas uh, storm we had, uh, a lot of power outages, and, and my young daughter ended up in our house uh, uh, with her dog cat and a couple of snakes. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of that going on here in Vermont. And so I, I wouldn't focus on the shelter numbers to focus on uh, the displaced. A lot of people living with relatives. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think that's, uh, again, true. When I was in Weston yesterday, one of our, our house members uh, was there to meet uh, as well, and uh, she's displaced and living at a, a friend's uh, mm -hmm. home. So it's hard to get a, uh, an exact number, but um, um, but um, it isn't as extensive as we had thought it could be. But again, I, I chalk that up to Vermonters being Vermonters and helping one another out and opening their doors uh, to those in need. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. The other, another question I have, are you, do you have a, a number or estimate for how many municipalities are at this point without running water? I think it's 10, sir. I'm sorry? I believe it's 10 this morning, sir. Right? I'm going to have you answer. <laughs> <laughs> boil water. Boil water. Boil water. Yeah, on the, on ten, the boil yeah. water, yes. Yeah, so a, a 10 on the boil water. Um, and I, I think the do not drink uh, has ended. It's one now still, right? Yes, ma'am. So one. A one on, on, uh, on uh, do not drink. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry, is it 10 under boil watch and one under do not drink? Yes, that's that's what the report was. Um, do you know how many, at this point, how many people have signed up to volunteer through the state volunteer portal? I do not. I don't, but I, we can, I can get the number, we can I get just don't the, have yeah, We it. can get that information to you or report it <clears throat> on uh, on Friday. Um, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. And seven days. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that question about the water. Do you know how many municipalities are without running water at all? We don't. I, I don't believe there are any municipalities without some functioning water of some sort. Uh, the quality is in question, but um, but I don't believe there are any shut down. Now, there are treatment plants, I know of at least three, uh, that are not functional at this point, uh, and that, uh, that's Johnson, Hardwick, and Ludlow. I'm on this call from Marshfield, which has no water of any sort running, and uh, they're kind of wondering what kind of assistance the state can provide. The FEMA's delivering us bottled water. Okay, I wasn't aware that the municipal system was out. Um, do you know? Are they a fire district, or is it the, is it the, is it the town? It's the town of Morningfield. <clears throat> our pipes were, um, our, our pipe were destroyed by a road that fell. Do you happen to know if your emergency management director has submitted that uh, request to the emergency operations center? Because that's the only way we will know that that is the case. Uh, I will ask him. I know the National Guard has talked to him. Uh, understood, but the National Guard is working with us in the Emergency Operations Center, and they the request there is a formal structure to request assistance from the State Emergency Operations Center. So reporting or chit-chatting with the Guard and, and receiving um, deliveries of water is not working the system that has been in place for a long time. So we are happy to jump right on that as soon as we get a request from your municipal officials. 
if FEMA is delivering a bottled water, surely they know that there's a problem. No, that's not true because bottled water is being delivered in many places that don't have clean drinking water. That's different than having no water at all. So, again, if you could, if we will happily look into it mm -hmm. and uh, circle back to the appropriate parties if, if you would like to get folks on the municipal level communicating up, we will certainly be reaching down for you. I will let him know to get in touch with FEMA. No. No, 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 no. With the State Emergency Operation Center. And we will be reaching out for you, I'm sure, by the end of this conversation, there will be somebody dialing up uh, the Emergency Management Director in Marshfield. Okay. Hey, so the, I have a completely separate question about the National Guard. I, I understand that there are 75 people deployed, and I'm wondering where they're working and what kind of work they're doing. I can start. I'm sorry, Colonel Tracy Poirier, the director of the Joint Staff. Could you just repeat the first part of that question? I heard 75, but I didn't hear what that was in reference to. I believe there are 75 members of the National Guard deployed in Vermont, and I'm just curious to know what they're doing and where they're working. Sure. Um, we actually have just over 100 now soldiers and airmen um, working on some portion of flood response. Some of those are in admin roles. Um, we have them broken up into several different teams. The first ones that came on, and I think I reported this before, so I won't get into too much detail, was the quick reaction force that we're doing search and rescue. That team um, has been working very hard and is getting towards a stand down. Right now they're on, um, they're on I think a four hour recall right now and when the rains are coming back in over the weekend, they'll be on a one hour recall. We also have the aviation team, which was very busy last week. They uh, haven't had any missions la yesterday or today. I think that mission is starting to stand down, but those folks are always available and ready. We do normal search and rescue all the time with the state, uh, with our aviation team. The, one, the team that gets the most work is the distribution team. So there's a lot of stuff that has to move around the state, and that is something we are very specifically and uniquely trained and equipped to do. So that has been um, one of our largest missions per like man hour spent, I guess is what I'd call it. There's a maintenance team attached to that to help them out on the road. And then we have the LNO team, which is I think what we've already referenced to. That team, um, they've been out to essentially 50 towns to date. There's another, I think we have a list of 132 to get to by the end of the weekend. Um, they've had some revisits for some of the hardest hit towns. Um, but I think that answers your question. Basically, a little over 100 is what's working right now. Um, is, okay, um, is that uh, more than is normally deployed? I mean, this, these are extra people that, that have been brought on because of the flooding, right? Correct. There are some of those hundred are regular full-time workers in the Vermont National Guard, um, but those that's a fairly small number. Most of those folks are part-time National Guard soldiers and airmen that have come on orders to meet these missions that the state needs from us. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. But before I take Tim's question, um, I was informed that we have 5,700 signed up uh, for volunteer uh, work. So 5,700 to date and climbing. Hi, Governor. Um, I, at some point, the uh, FEMA and SBA numbers on the direct impact of the storm will be known. But what is the, uh, the it, when do you think you'll have an indirect impact number? You know, restaurants and hotels that weren't directly impacted aren't getting visitors. Um, they're going to be, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, um, uh, tax impacts, rooms and meals in particular, gas tax, all those things. And the emergency board is meeting at, at some point pretty soon. Are, are the economists working up what might be the total impact on the economy at this point? Well, again, um, we had that scheduled meeting with the emergency board for the end of July, and that will still happen. We'll have more information uh, at that point, uh, probably trying to, to collect uh, all we can um, before that meeting so we have a rough idea of, of the trend. Um, but um, but it's something that's uh, unknown at this point. Uh, but when you drive through a place like Ludlow, uh, you can see uh, that it's going to be a little bit before they're able to open up some of those businesses, or whether it's in or Barry or Montpelier, uh, for that matter. So it will have an impact. We know that. 
Um, but um, but then we, we have to go to the recovery phase. And if there's something that I, I learned from Irene going through that, um, after when we entered the recovery phase, we had to remind people that not all parts of the state were impacted. Uh, in fact, uh, many were spared. And so people from out of state, not knowing that, were canceling rooms and not coming to Vermont. And we certainly, once we get through this uh, response and get into recovery, we're going to want to send that message that uh, when when that comes to be, uh, that, uh, that we're already willing and able uh, to, to welcome uh, folks from out of state to come and view Vermont and take advantage of everything we have to offer. It, will there, it, do you, I know that the congressional de delegation will be working on this, but would, would it take a, an act of Congress to get um, economic impact money, to, you know, similar to, to the ARPA funds and those things? Yes, I believe so, yes. But we're exploring every, every, you know, uncovering every rock and looking for opportunity. So we will continue to do that. And um, there are a lot of uh, creative ideas out there and we'll just run them through and see if, um, if they make sense for us. Can I follow up on a question? Yes. And I want to follow up on your question. I have a sticky note that got slid to me. Um, the SEOC has been in communication with Marshfield who reported that they were on a boil water notice. But we are reaching out again right now to make sure that that is still accurate. Okay, thank you. Tom, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, I don't know if this question is for you or Mr. Roy, but with the number of FEMA boots on the ground along with volunteers, um, why is it going to take so long to, to increase the number of counties that are being covered besides the six that have so far? There's lots of reports of sections of the state where the entire county damage wasn't that bad, but one particular section of it is, is pretty well uh, destroyed. And they can't yet check a box if the county is not on the list when they go to report online to FEMA. Do you have any insight on that? Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, first of all, the six counties that were declared uh, were done so via imagery, uh, not people walking on the ground uh, to take a look at it in order to, to meet the governor's you know, desire of, a, of an expeditious uh, uh, declaration by the president. Uh, and so uh, once that came out, uh, we are now on the ground, have completed, uh, have already completed are, are on the ground inspections of the non-declared counties to assess the overall damages to see if they meet the, 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 the you know, federally mandated requirements for individual assistance. Um, and so we're working close with the state. Because the governor has already asked for it, um, there isn't any additional requests from, from him. Uh, we are working closely with the staff uh, to assess those damages and as each of the, the county's uh, information is completed, uh, we forward that to FEMA headquarters for assessment to uh, whether they are capable to add those counties on. I, you know, we can never say when, uh, but I believe in, 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 in a very short period of time we'll hear about the potential for additional add-on counties. Uh, and again, to reemphasize, you know, because of the ongoing storm, uh, we were able to utilize uh, imagery that was available by a number of means to get the six clear, uh, declared counties. For the ones who are not declared, as you can imagine here in Vermont with the foliage we have, it's really hard to get imagery this time of year. Thank you. Uh, if I could have a follow-up on that, what is the criteria? So for instance, you've got a county that 10 or 15 percent has been completely destroyed, but the rest of the county is fairly well intact. Uh, does that happen where that county uh, to and therefore there's no assistance available to anyone in that county? So there are a number of factors that we look at uh, on the overall impact. The first thing that we really look at is homes. How many homes uh, were de de destroyed? How many homes were damaged? And those are damaged, was it a major damage? Was it minor damage or were they affected? And so our teams working with the state and locals, you know, go to those homes and do their overall assessment. 
Uh, and but there's other other a number of other of uh, other factors that you took a, take a look at, but those tend to be the, the, you know the primary ones that we focus on. And if, if so, if it does not get declared as one of the counties that's eligible, I'm sorry. Say again. So if, if that count is so if the county doesn't meet the the, the requirements uh, for for declaration, you're correct. It doesn't get added to it. But you know, to your point though, if there was a, a small part of the county that it impacted very badly, uh, and the and the number of homes damaged uh, is what we focus on, not the totality of the county. So if, if the majority of the county is okay, but you have a, a really hard hit area, uh, that. Uh, it does not discount the county from from being eligible for assistance for individual assistance. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also just want to say appreciate the level of communication out of all the departments in Vermont. It's allowed us to cover the damage versus trying to uncover the mistakes, um, and that's highly appreciated. Thank you. Keith Roman Harold. I'm all set for now, thank you. Back to the room. Uh, for FCO Roy, um, you mentioned a lot of the statistics um, that your survivor assistance crews have compiled, but just for Vermonters that haven't seen crews come to their homes yet, just what can they expect? And also those eventual inspections, just what goes into those as well. Yep, thank you for that question. Uh, so for our disaster survivor assistance teams, um, they usually operate uh, in two or three um, and they'll go to the home, they'll knock on the door, uh, uh, and they'll ask them, you know, uh, if they've had any damages, if they've had damages, if they've, if they've signed up for, for assistance from FEMA, if they have not, um, you know, they can help them, they have an iPad, they can help them sign up, uh, they can provide the information if they want to call in, um, and then uh, 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 if, you know, if there are damages uh, and they sign up, then the first thing that will happen is they'll get a call uh, from a housing inspector to coordinate a time for them to go take a look at the home. Uh, they'll show up, they'll have, they'll be certified, they'll have a badge to say, this is who I am, uh, and they'll take a look at the damage for, for the home. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll report that uh, back to the headquarters, and then their application will continue. Um, I would like to take this moment, for just a moment, to explain that there are letters that some of the applicants will receive where we're looking for more information. The way it is written uh, isn't, uh, is, it can be confusing. And so, but right in the first sentence it says, read this entire document. Usually what's, there's just something missing that's preventing us from, from moving forward, providing them the funding. Whether it's their, their insurance uh, uh, form, the, the, you know, the denying uh, their application, or, or some other piece of paper. So we encourage people, read the entire letter, uh, and then contact us, and we will help you um, to be able to, to figure out what it is you need to, to, uh, to get the assistance you need. We're also standing up uh, disaster recovery centers where people can physically go and sit down with one of our applicant specialists, and they can help them with that process as well. And we'll announce those locations as we work with the state to stand those up. Those aren't up and running quite yet. We have we have mobile registration intake centers uh, where, with uh, some capability, and we so we have one uh, right now. Uh, closest one here would be in Waterbury, um, and so that's where people can go to sign up. Uh, the governor has been kind enough to offer that armory for us to stand, to turn it into a disaster recovery center, so that people can go to get additional assistance there. Oh, oh, by the way, the the, spe uh, the small business administration will also be there with us. Warned against scams. I don't know if you'd be the best person to answer this, but just has there been any reported, any incidents reported yet, or are you guys just kind of preparing for that? We always prepare for that because we know it comes. Um, there, there actually was one report of it. Uh, uh, interestingly, it was actually accurate uh, because one of the things we do when we help people sign up for assistance, again, we have badges, we certify who we are. Uh, when they sign up, if they want an electronic funds transfer for their for their funds versus a check in the mail, uh, they obviously have to put their banking information in. And so I think there was some misinterpretation that that was a scam. But that, quite frankly, that helped us leap forward to ensure that people knew uh, that there are people out there who, who take uh, advantage of the situation on our public. 
Thank you, sir. Will FEMA ever reach out via phone or email, or if someone says they get a phone call or email claiming to be FEMA, that's most likely a scam? Unless they, unless they apply for assistance, they will not get a phone call. They'll get people knocking on their door, like we talked about, but of course they, they will be uh, batched. Thank you. Governor, I have a question about Montpelier. I've had a number of folks in town that have approached me and have expressed their, I guess, disappointment maybe, that they, they perceive that um, you know, FEMA and also the State Emergency Management um, folks just haven't been on the ground. They say that there's uh, a lack of presence there. Do you know if there's plans maybe to bring in more folks or to set up a tent to, um, to show that presence? Sure. Thanks, Calvin, for that question. Um, there's been a lot of chattering about uh, what the state hasn't been doing, what FEMA hasn't been doing. Uh, and I heard about that chattering yesterday afternoon. So I personally went to Montpelier and met with the city manager. And he and his deputy and my team are very clear about what the process is to request assistance from the State Emergency Operations Center. And they are very comfortable and pleased with the outcomes that they have received and with the um, items that we have still yet to deliver to them or, or that we've had to you know, do some problem solving with them. So we are very, very much working in concert with the city officials in Montpelier. So I don't know who you talk to, but there are many other people in the community who, um, even as I stood there talking to the mayor, expressed that they knew better how to handle this emergency than those of us who are working around the clock to actually address it. So I don't know if that helps you, helps you understand the context, but we are in person and on the phone speaking directly to officials and the emergency management director, which is the way the system is structured in the city of Montpelier and have 100% visibility two ways. And how do they communicate that to the volunteers and the folks on the ground, right? The officials are one thing, but there's also all of those you know, potentially hundreds of people that are, are doing the volunteer work. So how did that get communicated? That? I don't know. C candidly, I, don't, I can't speak because I'm not on the ground doing that type of work. Um, I did see an amazing, incredible volunteer uh, spirit in action down in Montpelier. Uh, I also went and visited the Berry Recovery Center up at the auditorium yesterday. Um, and I, I don't know what local to volunteer to volunteer organizations communications looks like. I'm sure it is different community to community. Uh, but I can tell you there's great volunteer spirit in every community I've seen. And the messaging from the State Emergency Operations Center has not changed since before this flooding began. The structure's in place. We have state emergency management plans. There are regional and local emergency management plans. We rewrite these plans. We update them. We exercise them with our local partners year round. And this was go time. And the structure exists, and it has to be followed in order for the entire ecosystem to work. Right? Thank you. And I'll also add that Montpelier was one of the first places that the state directed our disaster survivor assistance to, to go walk in door to door. So they've been there on multiple days as well. Just a quick money question as well. You mentioned there have been seven hundred ish thousand dollars that's been paid out in individual assistance. Yes. Approved. Approved. Approved, right? An uh, average of about $6,100. $6,100 per person. Is that the, the ceiling, or do you expect more money to maybe flow? To oh, oh, no, we, we've just started. I mean, we just turned the pro so we just turned the program on on Friday uh, because of the declaration. Uh, and by Monday, by Monday morning, people had money in their bank accounts. So that's how quickly uh, it turned. And we're just starting. And as I said, uh, for Katrina, um, there were roughly 4,000 people who had, had, had received aid. Um, we're already, uh, again, up to 1,600 people who have applied uh, and uh, over 1,500 people who are, are eligible for assistance. Uh, so it's moving fast. And, and quite frankly, it's moving fast because, you know, Vermont is, is leaning forward on this uh, and, and showing us where to go, uh, working with the local emergency managers and say, this is the area that you need to focus on to help with. And people, people are reading and saying, yeah, this is how I sign up for assistance from FEMA. Uh, and it's all because uh, the state you know, is really leaning forward. Thank you. Can I have maybe one more? Um, we've talked about 
assistance for homeowners a lot today, but is there any update in terms of for the, the houseless population, Vermont resources for them, uh, and how they've maybe been affected last week? Yeah, well, again, uh, the shelters are open to anyone, um, whether they were had a home or they were unhoused um, in any way. So we want to make sure that everyone knows, and they're still open uh, to those affected. So I don't have a number on that um, because we don't segregate the two. Uh, our shelters are open to anyone. Just one more quick one for Commissioner Haas. You mentioned uh, 988 uh, as a resource. I don't know if they've already gotten a big influx of calls or if you have that information at all. Yes, I do have that information. Um, let me get to it. Um, so the total calls answered from July 1st to July 16th was 378. Um, so breaking that out to the two weeks, July 1 through 8 is 193, July 9 through 16 is 185. We anticipate as folks start to digest what has happened, uh, they're more inclined to reach out for support. Um, so when we think about uh, responding to a, tra you know, a traumatic event, you're going to go through uh, ups and downs along the way. Those are going to be uh, anger, uh, sadness. Sometimes you're going to feel very content um, or all of those at the same time. We're all human. Um, and so we anticipate as folks start to settle into the recovery and looking at the amount of work and how long it will take to recover from this, that those calls start to increase. Uh, we just celebrated the um, year, first year of 988. Um, and so when I was meeting with that group up there, um, yesterday was at Northeast Kingdom uh, Human Services. There's also uh, Northwestern Counseling Services. Uh, those folks are ready to answer the calls, like I said earlier, from um, our community members who, who may need their assistance. Did you say 988 was primarily a suicide prevention it, number? It, sure. So it's for both. It's for anybody who's in distress um, or a loved one of somebody who's in distress. It doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who's experiencing um, thoughts of suicide. Uh, it's anybody who's having a tough time. Uh, so it's not defined. They, they are there to answer that call. Okay, um, with that, <clears throat> I just want to also thank the media once again for not just communicating uh, the information that we have, that we need uh, you to, to distribute to your listeners and readers, um, but also your feedback. Um, when we hear things like the Montpelier, city of Montpelier, folks in the, in the city uh, are feeling neglected in some way, um, we don't know that until we hear it. If we uh, hear that, uh, that Marshfield does not have water, sometimes we don't have all that information. So having you tell us uh, will at least trigger uh, another response from us to reach out to them. So we thank you for that, and uh, we'll be back on Friday uh, for another briefing. Thank you very much.